Yeah, we've been working on them for over 10 years. 2011 oh was our first meeting of, can we do something with the work for Kate O'Brien? And uh, here we are, 11 years later, discussing what we're going to do in 2023. So I suppose I became aware of the works of Kate O'Brien and um, as a composer I was interested in just using works in different ways and they've really become accidental arias. They're taking in um, a character's um, moment in their emotional journey within the books and within the stories and they're very dramatic. They're big songs, there's an awful lot of emotion in them but hopefully I think we tried to capture a sense of both the novel and the character and a little bit of the writer herself, Kate O'Brien. It's how can Kate O'Brien's work, name, presence, legacy, be seen and known and celebrated in a, in a bigger and more kind of Oh, kind of ubiquitous, kind of household name sense. I'm a relative and, uh, and an artist and um, a few years ago was invited to curate an exhibition about Kate O'Brien and at that time I had to do really a lot of research into who she was and you know kind of navigate maybe a familial connection with kind of the work and sort of bind it all together and think how do I connect as a, as a female artist um, with her and her legacy. I was looking for these points of connection and I was worried actually that I might not find them um, because I thought maybe she was a kind of dusty, fusty <laughs> character and she's not. She's like super cool, firebrand, amazing intellect, feminist, but also just beautiful human with deep thoughts about agency and women's rights and um, and the longings that we all have and the passions that we all have. So one of the songs we sang today was um, fr based on Henry from the Land of Spices. And it was really interesting to me because it was banned in Ireland because of one line where uh, he was found with Etienne uh, in a loving embrace. And it's really interesting to see something like that come so early in Irish literature because we always see, you know, 20th century Ireland as being so Catholic and so, you know, conservative that to see something, so uh, an author, a female author, pushing these kind of unusual narratives is really, really interesting. So I suppose technically, yeah, you, you could see them as a set of like a song cycle, you know, for, for soprano and baritone and contralto. But the way in which you sing and vocally, it, they're very dramatic. I have one line, the light of the last candle is quenched, and I just think it really encapsulates the whole mood of the whole work, yeah. you know, between what's going on between um, Vincent and Agnes and Mary Rose. It's just, uh, for me, it just kind of synopsizes the whole thing, for me mm. anyway. It shows how well Mary Call and Fiona work together mm. because their, the lyrics and the music, they complement each other. I find it fascinating reading her books especially when they're set in Melick, this sort of other word for Limerick. And she talks about Georgia Street and she talks about the Crescent. Um, there is in Without My Cloak, there's this whole description of the port. And Limerick Port, you know, was incredible in the 1900s and early 20th century <clears throat> and all the keys. And it's fascinating to read these in around these wonderful stories that also give this rather dark insight into early 20th century Ireland, the hold of the church, the, the hold that society had, the part that women had in this. And we were also talking about some of the male characters and how so few of them are, well, I don't like very many of them. Um, we like how, Henry, that's about yeah, it. Yeah, we like Henry. Um, and how entitled they are, and yet, you know, how women had to navigate this. And it's incredible to get this from, you know, uh, like you said, a very progressive, yeah. Woman Irish writer. First and foremost, she's writing. She's a woman, in, independently working, writing, making work at a time when it's not the done thing. Then the subject matter around women, particularly doing things in their own life, educating, being educated, traveling, leaving their marriages, um, also depicting love like that between men, love between women. And these things had to be coded. They had to be carefully veiled. They couldn't just be talked about the way they are now. The response was, this is dangerous. This needs to be stopped. This needs to be silenced. And it was easy to do that. She was talking about the, the climate crisis that was looming. She wrote in the Irish Times. I didn't get to say this to no. her, but she was writing in the Irish Times in the 60s and 70s about her fear of plastic. Plastic's gonna be washed up in the oceans in the future. 
What are all these straws and packets and cartons? Don't you know what's coming our way? Wow. Where are all the little birds going? You know, she had her eye on what was coming down the track, so. Wow. Yeah. It's her 50th anniversary coming up. Um, and already I'm, you know, from today and from the conversations and um, thinking, oh, there's, there's, there's a new opera here. It'll be interesting to see what happens when you bring other artists from other disciplines, mm. bring them all in and see what we can do. The 50th anniversary of Katie O'Brien's death is 2024. So that would be a really good year to really just, you know, we've bring all been saying really how there's always been this together. spark around her work, there's always been something fizzing away, but it'd be great to just use that fizz, that, that spark to just light a bonfire of Kate O'Brien for 2024.